Thank you. Thank you once again for inviting my wife and myself from London. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you. As Raghav said, I was a sadhu, a swami, for 20 years for a very affluent global Hindu organization. I just want to float a thought before I go into my story, into my journey. And that thought is that we are, we're all designed to search. It's in our very nature to keep searching for truth. We express it in different ways through our careers, through the way we pursue sports or music or dance or whatever it is. When you look at every human being's creative expression, especially when it comes to the pursuit of excellence, it comes from a deep internal design, and that is that we are always searching for something more. We're searching for a truth. The root word for truth is real. I just want to offer that thought before I start sharing my story. So my family are from Gujarat, but my parents were born in Kenya. A lot of the Gujaratis in the UK are from East Africa. My parents moved to England in the 60s with nothing. I was born there in London in a typical traditional Hindu family. We had a ghar mandir inside a special designated room. Every morning we would do the arati, then go to school, we come home, we do the arati. We didn't eat meat and all of the rules and rituals and religious activities were very, very pertinent in our house. But let me just share a little about Gujaratis when they moved to the UK from East Africa. They always wanted a place to belong. So small little pockets of mandirs were set up across London. My family regularly attended a mandir in northwest London. So this was a way of life, going to school in London. My brother and I, my brother is elder to me, we were the only Indians, only colored people in the whole school. So Monday to Friday, we were in this atmosphere. On the weekends, we would be in the mandir. At home, it was a very typical Hindu environment as well. Slowly, as I grew up in the West, I was exposed more and more to the mandir by my family. It was traditional. It was the way we did community. We maintained cuisine. We maintained culture that way. When I was 16 years old, I was made the youth head of the mandir in North London. And at that time, in 1988, the guru of the organization had come to London. And I was asked to speak and give a sermon. And for us, the guru was God. We worshiped him as God. He was the per personification of God on earth. There were 3,000 people seated in the audience. And from my school teachers, I, I knew that I had a gift of speaking. I was told this. And I shared the sermon on various Hindu scriptures. And everybody was really happy. The guru was ecstatic. I still remember the moment vividly today. After I gave my speech, I went and bowed at his feet. And he said, you'll become a very good swami, a very good sadhu if you become a priest. You know, you'd, you'd do really, really well. Immediately, I was just elated by this whole idea of serving God because he was God, going to heaven, having this incredible peace, incredible joy, this, this whole enlightenment that every human being is designed to search for. I will, I will have all of that. So I was 16 at the time. I finished my A-level exams in, in London. And by this time, I was so, so fanatic to search and serve God. Uh, my brother and I actually ran away from home to India to train in a monastery in Gujarat. The monastery is set on a 250-acre campus. It's a beautiful place. At any given time, there are 150, 200 sadhus training there. 
very vigorous training, very intense spiritual disciplines. It's a lifestyle of brahmacharya. Uh, you, don't not, you don't only have a bank account, you are not allowed to touch money. So every morning we woke up at 4.30, had a cold water bath, ready for the arti. And the whole day was vigorous academic training. We studied the Upanishads, the Ishakena, Katha Prashna, Mundak, Mandukya, Aitre, Taitre, the whole Vedas, the uh, Rama and the Mahabharata, the Gita. So all the various Hindu scriptures we studied when we were training to become sadhus. And then that particular denomination that I was involved with, those Shastras were studied in more depth as well. So the whole day consists of uh, puja, meditation, dhyan studies, exams, academia, and just this deep, deep sort of constant passion to keep searching for truth. What happened in 1991 was a very, very bizarre situation. This was my first month in training. We were upstairs in the mandir, 150 sadhus. I was in training, we were doing arti. I was bowing down to the idols. And suddenly I heard this very silent whisper in my left ear. And it was very simple. And it said, have you made the right decision? Are you in the right place? Immediately I, I literally lost balance. I thought it was Maya, a delusion. Uh, the devil trying to stop me from my path. But this voice was so, so sweet, it was so authentic, so, so real. I still remember this, I was staring over the balcony and something just hit me. But the training had started. I had left my family in England on not good terms. Not only that, the whole organization slowly began to know that this young fellow is the chosen one of the Guruji. And Guruji had a lot of affection for me. He picked me out of the audiences, he gave me special treatment, he would tell people while he would be speaking that this boy is destined for great things, he will do wonderful things for the organization. So all these different things were happening in my heart at one go. And this one doubt suddenly came and sat right in the center in my first year of training, but I buried it. You know, sometimes when we have authentic questions given to us, we find a way to bury those questions. I got busy in the training. Five years passed. In the sixth year, I sat with Guruji personally. And I said to him, you know, I'm doing this dhyan. We are fasting five times a month, doing five artis in a day. We are studying in depth. We're doing all of this spiritual activity and I just don't see any change in my heart. Not only that, when I look at your other sadhus who have been sadhus for 30, 40 years, I don't see a difference in their internal life. There is no change inside. And the Guruji at that moment said to me that you ask too many questions. And don't ask too many questions. This is the test of your mind. This is a test of your faith. As you do more, you know, this will come to you. My heart didn't believe him, but my mind chose to. I left the room, and in 1997, the Guruji placed me in London. Now, along with being placed in London, in my journey up until then, I kept on falling ill. While I was in India in the training, I had malaria five times. I had brain malaria twice. I was always on antibiotics. Different things kept on happening to my body as I was training. And I was taught in the theology that the body is meant for sickness. It gives you the chance to tolerate and develop your patience. Somehow, that didn't sit here comfortably, but my mind justified it. It sounded intelligent, it sounded philosophical, it sounded very, very smart. So I, I, I tend to believe that. In 97, I came to London with a doubtful mind. 
and I decided to still pursue my passion to search and serve Guruji. I was made in charge of the whole of Europe. I started getting very busy. Again, another way to bury my pain. I planted mandirs in Belgium. I planted a mandir in France. I planted a mandir in Portugal. I planted other centers in Milan, in Rome, in Geneva, Switzerland, in Sweden, in Norway, in Moscow. Slowly, I developed a congregation of 1,600 people across the whole of Europe. I became very famous in the organization. I was one of their most affluent speakers. On the outside, everything was wonderful. You know, I was traveling in business class, in first class. People were bowing at my feet. Before I even get onto the stage, 8,000 people are standing, giving me a standing ovation because I was known to be an eloquent speaker, a very smart speaker, an intelligent speaker. The irony was when I was speaking and preaching and teaching, I didn't believe any of it myself. I was in Norway once and I was speaking and I told the congregation, please don't record any of my talks. They thought I was being humble. I was actually telling them not to record it because I actually don't believe what I'm preaching. In Orlando, in 2007, I was asked to give the keynote speech at the National Convention. 8,000 people, after my 10 minutes of speaking, stood up and clapping. And they, they, they continued clapping for about one or two minutes. I left the auditorium and I went into my room in the hotel and I took an antidepressant tablet. What people were seeing on the outside was not happening on the inside. It was a very different story inside. So within this organization, I became the public speaker, I became their fundraiser. Any project that we would start within one year, I could raise one million pounds. I became their church, uh, their temple mandir planter. I developed congregations, started meeting prime ministers and presidents and ambassadors and key figures of society, all the fancy frills anyone desires and wants. I had all of that. But inside, there was no joy, there was no nourishment, there was no peace. So secretly, I went on my own search. I went back into the Hindu Shastras again, and I started studying other Hindu denominations. I studied the Gita again. I studied the Mahabharata again. Four times I went into the depths of that scripture to try and get something from it. I went into the Ramayana again. Then I looked at Sri Arvinda. I read his Savitri. I read his Transcendental Mind. That book is this thick. I read his letters. I read Vivekananda's works. All of it was very intelligent. It was really smart. It, it sounded really good, very philosophical, and very, very, you know, spiritually cool. But nothing was really feeding the inside. So I just continued getting more and more busy. As you do when you're in pain inside, you just stay busy. I was on a plane once a week, spreading the word of Guruji across Europe, America, Africa, I was doing 60 to 90,000 miles every single year. I did a yatra as well in India, 2,000 miles. I started in Gujarat in Mount Girnar at 8 o'clock in the morning and I climbed the 10,000 steps of Girnar to the ashram of Dattatre. I sat there for a while and meditated. I went on to Ram Janma Bhumi, Krishna Janma Bhumi. I bathed in the Ganga the Yamuna, Saraswati. I did a 2,000 mile all the way up to Calcutta, all the pilgrimage sites. I came here to the south. I did pilgrimage sites in, in Gujarat as well. So in the middle of all of my work, I was doing everything and anything I could to satisfy the deep desire of my search within my soul. And, and nothing was coming to fruition. So I became more and more sick. 
physically. More and more tablets. And then my journey once took me to Italy in Rome. I only had a very small congregation, nine people who were based in Rome. I was there, Sadhu, for that jurisdiction. So I went and they took me once to the Sistine Chapel, the Vatican. And uh, we went through the Vatican museums. And then finally you come to the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is where the Pope prays every Saturday. And, this, and the ceilings were done by Michelangelo 500 years ago. And the side paintings were done by Botticelli. On one side you have the stories of Jesus Christ and on the other you have John the Baptist. I was given a special place to sit. It was quite a, a strange scenario. In my orange robes, in my shaven head, I was sitting in, in, in the Sistine Chapel. But I remember this vividly. I looked up at the stories of Jesus and I just remember saying to myself, this all makes sense. I, I didn't know the stories of Jesus. I didn't know much about his life. I obviously knew because of my schooling certain basic things, but nothing in detail. All I said to myself was, this makes sense. Then I started walking into churches more and more. I found something quite tangible in the atmosphere. Something that was touching something deep inside that I had never recognized or known before. Now, because of my position in the organization, it was very high. People would never question anything I did when I would walk into churches or meet certain priests or cardinals. People never questioned. I just said, look, I'm studying. I want to know how these Christians, they do management, how they do their administration, how they manage their people. That's all I was making up these excuses. Slowly in my sermons, I started talking about a bigger God. I didn't know which God. I started sharing about a more beautiful God a God that doesn't confine himself to an image or a guru or even a building, a God that resides outside of that. Because I saw the beautiful Alps in Switzerland. I saw the Kukunov Gardens, the Tulip Gardens in Holland. I went to the Grand Canyon in America. I saw all this beautiful land around me, just the natural land, and I thought, if God created all this beautiful, vast land, how can he be confined to a simple image or a guru? He has to be bigger, he has to be better. So I started preaching in my sermons about a bigger God. And strangely, people were attracted to what I had to say. People were traveling for miles, wanting to hear me speak. I didn't know this, but uh, at the very senior level in the organization, the very senior sadhus were quite concerned with my theology, as you can probably understand. But I continued, and I continued my search for truth. I remember sitting in my office in the mandir in London. I was reading a book by Swami Vivekanand. I was trying to still stay steadfast to what I had chosen to believe. As I was reading the book, I heard a very silent whisper in my voice, and it was very soothing. All the voice said was, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that was it. And it felt so sweet. It felt so authentic, so real. I quickly shook it off because I was in orange robes and I had a shaven head. I was a Hindu sadhu in my monastery, in my office. I, I suppressed it, I pushed it aside. And I continued my travels. I continued my preaching, my speaking, my meeting famous people and just filling all these empty boxes with more empty things. By 2010, my body was so sick I was taking 40 tablets a day, every single day. That's how much 
manifestation of emptiness from my soul had entered into my body. I was taken to some of the best hospitals in America, in, in the UK, some of the best doctors, and still nobody could treat me. And then my brother, who is still a sadhu today in New York, he found out about the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Apparently, after the Mayo Clinic, there is nothing else in the world for medical treatment. My doctor in London sent my file to the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. I went to Florida in 2010. I sat there, and five doctors, each chairman of their department, were looking at me. I was 40 years old, and they said, all these illnesses at your young age, what is wrong with you? So then I began a 10-month treatment within the clinic. I was forced to rest, forced to be still, no activity. I told my PA in London and my team in London that you manage the whole of European operations. I need to sort this sickness out. In those 10 months, what was going on here for 20 years slowly started to articulate in my mind. Now, I was still asked to speak on the weekends in all the mandirs in North America, which I did. But in my speaking now, a different God was starting to formulate. After my treatment was finished, I came back to London, 2011, and I rested for one month, and then I came here to India, to Bombay, to meet the Guru. I had not met him for one and a half years, and he was like a father figure to me. He was my God, he was still my God. My heart maybe didn't believe it, but I, I chose to believe it in my head that he is everything, he's my father figure, he's someone I'm gonna follow for the rest of my life. I went into the meeting and um, he was very angry with my theology. I will not go into the meeting in too much detail, but as a punishment, I was asked to remain in the villages of India. And for the first time in my life, I said no to God. I said, I'm going back to London. That's where I belong, and that's home. He said, no, you're staying in the villages of India. I said, fine, then I don't want to become a sadhu anymore. And there was silence in the whole room. I don't know how I said that. I don't know how it came out of my mouth, but when it did, there was an incredible peace in my heart. And within seconds, the guru said, fine, go wherever you want to go, just go, leave. So 20 years of my service finished in 20 minutes in that meeting. I was given two pairs of trousers and two pairs of shirts. I was sent back to London. The guruji said to me, before you leave, what two conditions, you can never give a speech again in your life. You're not allowed to meet anyone that you know. I came to London, I stayed in a hotel that belonged to a friend, and um, he said, I will not tell anyone you're here, just rest, and let's find you a job. <laughs> After 20 years of being a sw Swami, to write a CV is very difficult. I gave up the whole search of God. I was very hurt and disappointed with my life. Um, 20 years I felt was wasted. One day I was walking to the railway station to go into the city just to get some fresh air and my head turned and I saw this beautiful church down a quiet road. I said, okay, that must be beautiful architecture, you know. I had forgotten all my moments about Jesus anyway, I was so hurt. I walked into the church, I walked down the road and the red doors were there, I still remember. I walked inside the church and the presence of God just fell on me so beautifully this blanket of deep, nourishing peace, and a whisper in my ear said, you are now home. That was it, friends, you know, for me. I went inside the service, I sat upstairs, I listened to the sermon, I listened to the worship, and this joy leapt in my heart, in my spirit. I left the church, I didn't go to the city, I went back to the room, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. There was no theological reasoning. There was no debate. There was no preaching. Just the reality that he is alive and he is living. So my 
time is up here, and I just want to share literally 15 to 30 seconds to tell you why I love Jesus Christ. When I came to the Lord, the first thing I had to do was detox from religion because Jesus is relational. He loves you as you are. There's nothing you can do in your life that could make him love you more. And there's nothing you've done that could make him love you any less. You are loved. This took me three years from here to come here. The sole purpose of my life, God said to me, when I gave my life to Jesus, was to be loved. No fancy titles, no speaker, no writer, no fundraiser, no planter of ch churches. You are a son of God and you are designed to be loved. And Christianity is not a Western religion. If you read the Bible, its culture is very close to Indian culture. You don't have to leave your culture to follow Jesus. Jesus is relational, he's not religious. He loves you as you are. And you cannot work for his love. This took me four years to understand. I was doing pujas and pilgrims and mantras and readings and fastings. You cannot earn the love of God. Any decent father and mother does not require their child to earn their love. The child is loved as they are. So Jesus Christ loves you. He wants to be with you. It's a personal relationship. He designed you uniquely, fearfully, wonderfully, beautifully. So he designed you and he is speaking to you right now. In the way you are uniquely designed, he is speaking with you. And he wants a personal relationship with you. He doesn't need an institution to speak to you. He can speak to you wherever you are, in your lunchtime, on the street, in the park, and he loves you and he wants that relationship. And he will free you from the inside, which is what happened in my journey. My heart was healed, my body was healed, and my spirit was healed. And that journey continues beautifully with Jesus. When I came to the Lord, I had no food for three days. This was my condition. Nobody wanted to speak with me. I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have any work, forget any money. There I had everything, thousands of people bowing at me, first class travel, luxury cars, food everywhere. And yet here in Christ, this joy, that's not laughter, what the world call laughter, this joy of this living God, when you spend time with him, overrides every materialistic idol that we come across in today's world. I didn't think once I should not have left. I was in a dire situation. I didn't know how to write a side CV. But the peace, love, and joy of Jesus Christ is so deeply nourishing. It just, I just chased him even more. And I continue to do that today. Thank you very much for hearing my story.